When you meditate, you want to understand both the how and the why. How you meditate, why you meditate. If you simply focus on the how, it becomes mechanical, simple matter of technique. Something you do while you sit here with your eyes closed, and then you drop it and go off and do something else. But the why helps it, the practice to seep into the rest of your life, give you a new perspective on what you're doing with your life. Because that's always the emphasis in the Buddhist teaching, is the doing. Why we do things. And are we really getting the results that we want from the things we do? The first, the how. Close your eyes. Sit up straight. And focus on your breath. Know when the breath comes in, know when it goes out. All the way in, all the way out. Try to stay with the sensation of breathing. Wherever you find it clearest to follow. For some people it's the sensation of breathing in the nose. Others it's the movement of the chest the movement of the abdomen, any place in the body where you can sense now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And wherever you focus, allow the sensation to be comfortable. So it feels good breathing in, feels good breathing out. If it feels good, it's a lot easier to stay with the breath. This may require adjusting the, the rhythm and the texture of the breathing. Deep breathing or shallow breathing, heavy or light, fast or slow. You can change the speed and the texture of the breath in the course of even one breath, especially when you're do, doing long breathing. Be careful that it doesn't get too strained. And then once you've been able to get the breath comfortable, think of that sense of ease flowing through all the nerves of the body. Because the sensation of having a body here is a type of breath energy. If we didn't have the breath energy in the body, we wouldn't know we had it here. We wouldn't feel it. We wouldn't sense it. So try to think of all these sensations as being connected. That also helps, not only making the breath really comfortable deep down inside, but also helps keep you awake. And if your range of focus is too narrow, it's very easy once the breath gets comfortable to fall asleep or to start just drifting off. in and out of focus. So make sure that once there's a sense of ease, you allow it to spread, like melted butter spreading over toast, seeping down into the holes of the bread, saturating the bread. And then once you've got a sense of ease filling the body like this, try to maintain it. Be careful, because there will be a tendency for your awareness to shrink. So try to keep aware of the whole body breathing in, whole body breathing out. That in a nutshell is the how, how you do the meditation. The why takes more explaining. But in brief, it comes from our reflection on our own lives, realizing that we do things and say things and think things primarily because we want happiness. That's the underlying motive all the time. You know, to what extent do we really find happiness? Do we actually create happiness? Many times the things we do create pain instead both for ourselves and for the people around us. 
and we can set our sights on goals and spend our whole lives working at things that will not bring happiness at all. So the purpose of the meditation is to deal with that issue, to put the mind in a position where it can really reflect on what is true happiness and also what are the actual results of our actions. What do we need to change? Because it is within our power, one, to change, and two, to find true happiness. So this is why we meditate, is to be more sensitive to our own actions, and particularly the actions of the mind. Now the how and the why are not radically separate. I was reading recently, going back and rereading one, some of John Lee's instructions on meditation, basic introductory meditation. And I was struck by how often he refers to the word sangwega as a way of inducing concentration. You got the mind to reflect on things in such a way, he says, that you induce this feeling of sangwega. Now, sangwega is a hard term to translate, but it's related in Pali to a word that means terror. What it comes down to is when you start reflecting on your life and the things that you've been attached to, the things that you've been thirsting after and looking for, you become to see how pointless it all is. All that energy, all that effort focused on something that's not going to help you at all to find your happiness in many ways sets you up for major disappointments. That's what the terror is all about, is that you see how complacent you've been. focusing on things that have no substance, of no real worth, and then doing things that actually put you in harm's way, set you up for a fall, a major fall. You've probably seen people who look back on their lives. You've read of cases where people have worked very hard for something and look back on their lives and realize that the whole time was wasted. That's scary. That's why the that's that element of that puts the edge on Sangwega. There is an element of terror. There is that possibility. You could spend your whole life struggling for something very hard, and then it doesn't provide you any help at all. We see people in old folks' homes, say professors who've worked very hard at trying to understand a subject, and then they get Parkinson's and they forget it totally. They get to the point where they can't even recognize their family. People have worked, worked very hard at being fit all of their lives, and all of a sudden the body turns on them. We've seen people dying, and all the things they've done in their lives don't seem to help them at all at that moment. That's scary. Because you could be in those positions as well. And when you reflect on this, it helps sharpen your focus on the meditation. It's a common pattern through the, throughout the Buddhist tradition that the feeling of sangwega is paired with basada. Basada means a sense of confidence that there's a way out, and this is it. you realize how other things are closing in on you, that this is the one way. This sharpens your focus, gives you more energy to practice, to try to understand how is it that the mind can spend so much time working, working, working for happiness, and yet doing it in ways that actually cause suffering or leave you unprotected when aging, illness, and death come. So it's good sometimes to reflect on these things, to remind yourself of why you're here, 
and it helps put more energy into learning how to develop the skills that will protect you from those dangers, mindfulness, alertness, concentration and discernment. All founded on the sense of basada, or it's also sadha, which means conviction. Conviction that your actions can make a difference, and there is a way out. This way, Sangwega is paired with heedfulness. You realize your actions are important, and so you have to be very careful about what you do, because it is very easy to get to slip off the path. And lead, life, lead a life of quiet desperation that ends up in major disappointment. So you've got to be careful. Another emotion that's good to reflect on is what they call nibidha, which can mean disenchantment. Sometimes it's translated as revulsion. This comes more toward the end. After you've gained powers of concentration, you can really look at where you've been trying to find happiness. And this is where the Buddha's image of feeding comes in. There's a passage in the canon where he's teaching a young novice, and the first question is, what is one, what is two, what is three, what is four, on up through what is ten? And two, three, and four up to ten deal with the well-known teachings of doctrine. Two is name and form, three is the three kinds of feelings, four is the Four Noble Truths, and so on. One is interesting. The question is, what is one? All beings subsist on food. This is how the Buddha introduces causality. In other words, causality, interconnectedness, is not always a pretty thing. It's essentially feeding. And if you're feeding on something inconstant and undependable, you have your life is inconstant and undependable. And this image of feeding also goes in, into a deeper level when the Buddha talks about clinging, because the word for clinging also means the act of taking sustenance from something. And here again, the Buddha has you reflect on where you try to find happiness. And realize that you've been feeding on things that really don't provide any solid nourishment. That's when the feeling of revulsion comes in, or feeling of disenchantment. Now the Buddha has you develop this as the mind has developed concentration, because you've been, through the practice, you've been learning these strengths of conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. These strengths that nourish the mind. As you practice, you want to feed on these things, but ultimately they put the mind in a position where it's so strong it doesn't need to feed anymore. And so in this case, the sense of disenchantment or revulsion leads to dispassion. From dispassion there's release. You let go of the things you've been clinging to. And in the image of fire, as it's used in the Pali Canon, once there's letting go, there's release, i.e., the reason you're stuck on things is not that they're hanging on to you, you're hanging on to them. In the same way that the fire, they say, clings to its fuel. And it goes out when it lets go. It's unbound because it lets go. The same image applies to the mind. We cling to form, feeling, perceptions, thought constructs, and consciousness because we think we'll get some nourishment out of them. But when we learn that they really don't have that nourishment, they can't provide it. You realize you've been feeding on junk food all the time. If you let go, through the strength of the practice, it means you don't have to feed on anything at all. When you let go, you're freed. You're unbound. So this is why we practice. We see that we've been 
looking for happiness in the wrong places, making the mind dependent on things that can't really provide it any shelter or refuge. So instead we learn to develop the qualities of mind. We have confidence that these qualities of mind will grow and develop and provide the mind with a path out to freedom, a freedom that's unconditioned. So unconditioned we don't have to feed on any conditions at all. So we move from a state of heedless feeding to a state where we become more heedful. Then to a position where we don't have to feed at all. That's how the how and the why come together. So it's useful to reflect on these things. A lot of the medita meditation deals with the how, the techniques, how you deal with this problem, how you deal with that problem. But it's always good to keep things in perspective by remembering the why.